did very short. We, we have a half an hour, I but you'll take all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would think we should all remember, at least in our thinking today, a man who gave his life to Nuremberg, whom all you Nuremberg's know, Robert M. B. Kempton. Yes, thank you very much. Wait a minute, I have to say one more word. Okay, that's he a big long word, but go ahead. For 70 years, from the early 20s in Germany, in the Weimar Republic, with risks to himself, he fought through, uh, left Germany in 1935, returned in 45, and he would have loved every word that he has been said at this wonderful meeting. And he kept on fighting not neo-Nazism and the shadows that were left after Nuremberg in Germany until he died in 1993, I almost said 1893, 1993, still with a piece of work in his lap that he was working on concerning some of the shadows of neo-Nazism. And he was known in Germany and not complimentarily as Mr. Nuremberg in many, many editorials throughout the years. Uh, Thank you very much. He developed a very good Germany. That Helped was a very a nice Germany. one word, and I'm glad that you made it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob Temple was a dear friend, and, and indeed he did carry on the, uh, the, the, the Nuremberg battle for many years, a sole voice in Germany, and as you said correctly, unpopular many times. Uh, when my wife tried to caution me about going back into Germany, as I did consistently, <coughs> she said, they're going to kill you. And I said, no, if they haven't killed Bob Kempner, they're not going to kill me either. <laughs> he, was, he was the canary in my coal mine. There's a question back there. He took precautions not to get murdered and felt it was a great, great triumph when he succeeded in getting out of Germany. He was so happy with the victory. Yes, it was. And he carried on to the end. Not a question, uh, for Ray, Ray, wait a minute. No <coughs> question, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I'll relay the question. All right. For Bell, I was wondering, I've been uh, proctoring the reconstitution of I.G. Farben yes. after the reunification, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. I noticed that in different business pages that there are shareholders that they exist that try to get them to make compensation. Uh, to some of their victims, so I was wondering if you could... Uh, um, the question, may I repeat the question in regards to I.G. Farben, the question is addressed to Bell, uh, whether the reconstruction of the I.G. Farben company, uh, how that affects the claims for compensation, which many survivors <coughs> had against the I.G. Farben company and still have. Uh, Bell, do you want to comment on that? Uh, um, that's a very interesting uh, question. I, I didn't know until a year ago or so that I.G. Farben was still in existence. I thought it had been broken up, and of course today it's Herxt and Bayer and BASF. But I discovered that I.G. Farben was not only in existence, but the two men from the, um, who had been, um, <coughs> laborers at Auschwitz in the Farben Buna rubber camp had been awarded two million dollars. They brought a lawsuit, they've been pursuing this lawsuit for something like 40 years, and finally they got two million dollars from IG Farben. Incidentally, um, um, in each case, their families had been decimated by the SS. Was that what you were referring to, the $2 million? Well, yes, but also I've noticed that the shareholder meetings are in resolutions that have been violently denounced by I.G. Farben, uh, board of directors. I was just wondering if there was any other progress for the other people who are, who are trying to get claims. No, I only know about uh, these two um, people who were in the factory. Benny, do you know? Uh, yes, may I add something to that? If you will look at the book, Less Than Slaves, which is now out of print, but in most libraries, you'll find, oh, you have it there. Then you know the historical background of the attempts to get compensation from I.G. Farben. They did pay 10 million marks, which had to be divided among all the known survivors at that time. I am unfamiliar with anybody getting a $2 million judgment and collecting on it against I.G. Farben. Uh, so I cannot comment on that. Are there any other questions? Here's one here. I have a comment uh, 
about uh, milk. Heinrich Hoffmann, Hitler's personal photographer, who worked directly under me during the trials, told me this one. Go to the Can you step to the microphone, oh, please? Sorry. We're going to have a mic in different places. If first I want to put a question, please come up to the microphone. Just stand on line there, and I will alternate between recognizing you. Just step up to the microphone. It'll make it easier. Please. I have a... Uh, what is your name, sir? Lawrence Ray. Photographic evidence. Directly under me, during the trials, worked Heinrich Hoffman. And uh, one day we were talking about things, and he told me this about general milk. It was pointed out, I believe, if I remember correct, that Guderian pointed out to Hitler that milk was a half a Jew. And... I, I that, know, what's yeah. the question? No, no, this, I, just a comment, not a question. A comment? Do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, just, just a moment. And Hitler, quite irritated by this comment, and he liked milk, said, I decide who is a Jew. Okay? Very nice story. Do you want to add a comment? Yeah, I know, I know. I think that was the charge. It's pretty well known uh, that that was uh, said in private about milk. I, I doubt that it was ever proved. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's a good illustration of how they treated the application of uh, some of the, there were, I, I believe that Gary would have protected him anyway. Anybody has a question, please step up to the microphone. Don't be shy. It doesn't bite. In the meanwhile, I'll tell you that I like milk myself. I was raised on it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. The lady is coming up with a question or a comment. If you have a comment, you want to tell us how marvelous this has been, we will accept a half a minute on that. We have about 20 minutes left to go. Young lady, your name, please. Marta Pantleon, administrative assistant to Mr. Hodges' language division for the 12 trials. I would like to repeat a question which I already put to General Taylor after the end of the trials, which was why certain German judges who had been sent away by Hitler because they were not Nazis, because they refused to join uh, the party, and who emigrated in part, like, for instance, Dr. Galeski, who came back as an interpreter and translator, why they did not associate these German jurists when they started the trials, because the German public, there was quite a great part of it that had things to say against the Nazis who had, which had been persecuted and recruited by the Nazis. I was one, one among them. And uh, the German public would have accepted the result of the IMT trial and the 12 trials, the later trials, much more and approved if there had been some German jurists associated. Uh, I assume the uh, question is why there were not German judges among the judges on the bench to try the criminals. Yes, uh, but they were not. Is, is there anybody else here on the panel who would like to comment on that, or anybody in the audience who would like to comment on that question? I'll comment on that. In the Versailles Treaty after World War I. Yeah. Just sit there, but it's easier to hold it that way. Uh, lean forward. <laughs> In the Versailles Treaty after World War I, there was a provision for trying German war criminals. The British, I think, submitted a list of 600 potential defendants. Nobody was turned over, except the Germans ran one trial in Leipzig of a submarine crew, I think a couple of officers and three or four uh, enlisted men on the submarine crew. The submarine was charged with torpedoing a, a well-marked hospital ship and machine gunning all these survivors who got the lifeboats. Essentially, I think four or five of the defendants were acquitted, and the defendant that was convicted got a two-year sentence, and that was commuted in due course. So I think it was a consideration on the Allied part that you could not have Germans try Germans for their offenses during the war. Thank you very much, Walter. i just add a word to that. I think politically, too, it would have been very difficult uh, 
you tell the survivors of persecution that among those sitting as judges now against the others would be some anti-Nazi judges who are of German nationality. Politically, that would have been very difficult, and I'm sure that contributed to it. Sir, you have a question. Yes, I know this. Your name, please. My name is Philip Rosen, and I interviewed uh, Josiah Du Bois. I know Bell probably knew him pretty well, Josiah Du Bois. Josiah Du Bois was a prosecutor uh, of the IG Farben. And I just want to mention to this audience some of the things that he said to me. Uh, I want to give him the credit, too, because not only was he a prosecutor of I.G. Farben, but he was crucial in the creation of the War Refugee Board because he exposed the per perfidy of the State Department by writing a memorandum called The Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. That's all described in a book called While Six Million Died by Arthur Morris. But I just want to say, just for the information here, in regard to it, he had never tried any cases prior to the IG Farben case. He said, I didn't understand why they chose me to do so, but he said that Telford Taylor and the other people couldn't find any lawyers that wanted to do it. He says he couldn't, they couldn't find them, so, so they chose him even though he had no experience. He had always been involved in Treasury. He, and interestingly enough, after the trial was over, he said the kind of sentences that were meted out befit, befitted a chicken thief. And quite ironically, the first case when he returned to Camden, New Jersey, across the river from me, was a chicken thief case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, all of us old timers know and highly appreciated Joe Du Bois. His comment about there being nobody else was an expression of his own modesty. Uh, in fact, uh, Joe was selected because of his complete dedication to the cause of the oppressed. He had demonstrated that not only at Treasury, but in the War Refugee Board and other work that he had done in Washington. And despite the unfortunate judgment which Bell has described to you, Joe Du Bois and Bell and Morris Amption and uh, the others did an excellent job. Uh, and uh, let me also at the same time mention now that I'm talking on your time and not on mine, the other prosecutors who are not here today, who also did excellent jobs, who have not, we have not gone over their trials. The medical case, Sandy Hardy is no longer with us, but his wife is. I hope she's somewhere within the sound of my voice. She was uh, an inspiration to him during the days of the Nuremberg trial. He did an excellent job. Jim McHaney is no longer with us. Marilyn McHaney is still alive. She was unable to come here. Uh, my wife Gertrude, who is somewhere in the audience here, also worked on the Krupp case and helped to set up the subsequent uh, special projects division where we turned these records over to the Germans. She also began on the publication which Drex Brecker brought to fruition the 15 green volumes. Unfortunately, the German text was buried somewhere in the archives of the Pentagon. It could have been used to show the Germans themselves in their own language, their own documents, uh, which were the basis for the trials. And there were many others who unfortunately are not here who played a key role in putting these uh, crimes uh, on the record and in advancing the rule of law. So thank you again for reminding me of that. And young lady, you have a question. Identify yourself, please. I'm uh, Edith Simon Caldwell. I work for Dr. Kibner. But I would like to uh, give credit to another man whose name is not mentioned very often, surprisingly, and that's Raphael Lemkin. Uh, uh, those of you who knew him, he was a judge in Danzig, lost his family, and he made genocide his life's work. And as you know, he buttoned all of you at Nuremberg to use the word in court till it was used finally and introduced in international law. He did the same thing at the United Nations. I saw, it, saw him there at the delegates lounge doing exactly the same thing. He was a single issue man. And I think we have to thank him for introducing I, the word. I thank you as well for drawing that again to our attention. Uh, for the benefit of those who may not know it, not only did Raphael Lemkin invent the term genocide and Bob become a complete nag and bothering everybody to make it a part of international law, which he finally did. Uh, there was a bust on a Raphael Lemkin, a bronze bust, which was on display at some time in the uh, visitor's entrance to the General Assembly Hall of the United Nations. 
and he has become a respected name. He has written a very good book uh, with his ideas in it, and I can use that as a model and inspiration. What you can do, even as one person, and has been an inspiration to me as well, if you never give up and carry forward uh, the ideas that humanity is deserving of protection. Mr. Ramler, would you please identify yourself? Siegfried uh, Ramler, a court, court interpreter. I wonder if Bill, Mayor, and perhaps you, Ben, could amplify on one thing. You mentioned that the subsequent proceedings, and particularly the Krupp case uh, and IG Farben cases, were influenced by the Cold War and that the sentencing had a lot to do with that type of atmosphere. Could you be perhaps a little bit more specific in terms of pressures that were exercised on the judges and on the prosecution at that time that were manifestations of the Cold War as they related to the subsequent proceedings? Thank you. I think you've all heard the question. I will repeat it, and I will assume to answer for our, our chief of Alfred Taylor the suggestion which at one time appeared in the film Justice at Nuremberg that the prosecution was in any way influenced by any outside political pressures is an absolutely false suggestion. Uh, there was no influence whatsoever uh, on any of the prosecutors or on any of the trials. We carried out the trials as best we could on the basis of the evidence we had. Let me take a moment to refer to Mr. McCloy because several of the prosecutors mentioned him and uh, he is generally in this audience considered to be a great uh, evildoer in undermining and undercutting what happened at Nuremberg. I knew John McCloy quite well. When he was military governor of Germany, I was running all the restitution programs. Uh, and I saw him very regularly, and I saw him very frequently during the time that he was agonizing over the Nuremberg judgments. Uh, it was necessary for him to sign the death warrants. Thirteen of those death warrants were defendants that I had prosecuted. These were my boys, if I can use the terminology. And uh, I was then representing all the leading Jewish organizations of the world, and they were putting heavy pressure on me to try to influence McCloy. I refused to do that. I said that he is engaged in a personal process of having to sign the death warrant for a number of people, and he will do it in accordance with his own views. What he did subsequently was to release many of the defendants, reduce many of the sentences, and thereby, in effect, from a public relations point of view, undercutting the Nuremberg trials, for which the Nuremberg lawyers, some of them, have never quite forgiven him. But that, in my judgment, is a misinterpretation and a misunderstanding of what Mr. McCloy was really trying to do. He's a very humane human being. I will explain what he was trying to do, and I will give you the basis for my opinion. He was not being influenced in the sense in which the question was put to release defendants. He was himself a former Wall Street lawyer who had a certain natural sympathy for people like Crook, uh, big industrialists. But his primary concern was to try to level the punishments against different defendants for different, different sentences for this, essentially the same crime. And he therefore appointed a clemency board consisting of three representatives, uh, one from the State Department, one a renowned judge from the Court of Appeals of New York, and another one a penologist to review the trials. And in his top secret or secret instructions to them, which I obtained subsequently with great difficulty, he told them specifically, you are not to challenge or review the judgments or sentences imposed by the Nuremberg tribunals. This is established law. Your job is to consider any humanitarian or family considerations such as health, disparities in sentences, and make your recommendations as to what adjustments, if any, should be done. The clemency board then came and gave him a secret report as to what their recommendations were after sitting in Munich for a few months reviewing the sentences. They never looked at any of the Nuremberg records. These were kept in, I think it was Frankfurt at that time, uh, and the legal department of Office of Military Government, Amgus, had their legal staff at their service. I was then functioning still out of Nuremberg, 
And I wrote to the judges and I said, gentlemen, if you need any assistance or any help in your job, I'm here at your service. They replied and said, we don't want to hear from the prosecution. I was, of course, outraged at that because I didn't then understand what their assignment was. But their assignment was not to challenge the facts, to accept the facts. Then they gave Mr. McCloy their recommendations. If he had been politically motivated, he could have accepted their recommendations as stated and said, this is the recommendation of an impartial panel. He didn't do that. He sat down and reviewed every sentence himself with great anguish. I saw him during those times and occasionally he would mention to me that he was agonizing over those sentences. If he were politically motivated, he would not have imposed any death penalties because he was under pressure, real pressure at that time, not from the Nazis, but from the anti-Nazis, the Social Democrats, the church came to him and said, don't execute these people. We want to abolish the death penalty in Germany. Do not carry out any executions. Show your clemency. It was a clemency board. McCloy reviewed the sentences. If he were politically motivated, he would have made some harsher, he would have made some lighter, he would have accepted them. He confirmed several of the death sentences and the people were executed, my boys. He also increased the sentences, in many cases, beyond what the clemency board had done. And I had this list, and it was a secret list, their recommendation and the other, and I put it together. And I didn't publish it because Pelford thought correctly that it would divert the thrust of the book that I was then writing. And surely all of you, and I'm included among them, feel that it resulted in an undercutting of the trials and the political impact because the public, including many here, believe this was a form of review, judicial review, in which they reduced the sentences. It was not a judicial review. It was one man's judgment as a decent human being as to what he thought was the appropriate sentence in each case. His judgment, in my opinion, was seriously wrong. I discussed it with him much later. Uh, in many cases, it was seriously wrong. But nevertheless, that was his judgment, and it was not a matter, in my opinion, of political influence. The trouble is, Ben, that that doesn't... Walter, well, you have a comment on that. Yes. Into the mic. I didn't know McCloy, and I never wanted to know McCloy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's going too far. The problem with your explanation, other than the death sentences, is it does not explain why, across the board, virtually every prisoner who got a sentence had it commuted almost promptly at the ending of the trial. Not true. Not true. Every Look at the facts. Every defendant that I knew about. Him. Maybe your defendants. Your defendants you never even tried. Carmen Abbs never stood trial and others. But it's not true. If you take the table, the list which I have prepared, I, I get donated all this to the Holocaust Memorial Museum. So any Holocaust people here, Holocaust Memorial Museum people here, we all accept. these records we are... Accept. We accept. They are there. The records are there to be verified and seen. Yes. The seal judge should then get... Uh, I Excuse me. Not about the floor, but I wanted to ask to, the, to the gentleman who asked about Mr. Rambler. Rambler. who asked about the political pressures uh, uh, caused by the Cold War. I want to. Um, uh, I agree completely with Ben and with anybody who was there. The Army. It was then the War Department, not the Defense Department. Not only never never um, um, <clears throat> suggested in any way that we uh, discontinue the trials or uh, try in any way to pull the rug out from under us. They were very, very helpful. In fact, at the beginning, it was Henry Stimson as much as Judge Rosenman who, who um, recommended to Truman that these trials be held. However, I will say this, that in 1946, before the, the fall of 46, before the IG Farben case began, James Byrne, the then Secretary of State, had made a speech in Stuttgart, I think, somewhere in, in Germany, um, saying that the, 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 the day was approaching when we would have to fight the Russians 
and we needed the Germans' help. But that was not, uh, cannot be contributed to the United States government, even the State Department. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. We have Judge Seal Gutz, who was then not judge. We have the judge of human character, one of our leading prosecutors, has a question. You don't have to identify yourself. I've just identified that. For those around the corner, it's a handsome young lady standing at the microphone. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I ended up as second in charge of Crook. So I, uh, I, I stood up to part company with you on your explanation of McCloy as being dominated by humanitarian considerations. The Lex Crook was, had nothing to do with hu humanity. It was had to do only with money, and there was no reason why McCloy had restored to Alfred Crook all the money which had been declared forfeit. And one thing more, just one thing more, as I understood you, 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 you said that the direction to the clemency board was to make sure that all the sentences were parallel, something like that. Something like that. Well, it seems to me that that undercut the, the, the principle that I think one of our speakers referred to the, the Nuremberg trials were supposed to be individual guilt, and each defendant was supposed to be assessed or evaluated on the basis of his record, his knowledge, and what he had done. And I don't think that under those circumstances, you can even everything up, particularly if you don't look at the records you say. I, I will give you the floor in a moment. Let me just add to the specific point about uh, uh, returning to Crook all of his assets, which is part of Mr. McCloy's clemency action regarding John McCloy. I discussed that with him afterwards at some length. Um, his feeling there was that since the only defendant of all the Nuremberg trials against whom there had been a levy of property fine, removing his property, was Krupp, that this was sort of a bill of attainder approach to the problems, and it offended his legal sense that this one person uh, had all of his property taken away from him, and therefore he, in fact, restored it to him, uh, which I held against him for a long time, but I used it for advantage of the Nazi victims. Um, didn't it ever occur to him maybe the vice was the other way and more money should have been taken away? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Henry? Yeah. You want to comment? But now we have just one minute left and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I have uh, one comment. Oh, my wife has a question. Yeah. i got to let her go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Spear got a 20-year uh, sentence, Mel Scott wife. And in terms of participation in activities, there's no question that Spear was more important. I assume that when Milch's sentence was commuted to 15 years, there would be some reflection on the fact that Spear got uh, 20 years and Milch got life. Uh, I don't know. It would, it would tend to support the uh, proposition that Ben has expressed that there was some comparison between the various sentences of the defendants. I think that's what you were trying to say. Tim. That was the assignment yeah. uh, to the clemency board. Uh, if there is anybody who wants the last question, I think my wife's holding up her finger. But would you please step to the mic? Oh, you can't get through. All right, I'll repeat the question. That is from She Who Must Be Obeyed. My wife, Judge Ruth, we're, selling our fifth, we're setting, celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary next week. on the Crook case. My wife, is my prompter, reminds me that uh, I uh, was highly critical of Mr. McCloy uh, in his action in the Crook case in particular. I sent him long memoranda on the subject afterwards. Uh, he had a copy of my book, Less Than Slaves, uh, and he sent me a nice note. I assume it was sincere, and he said that if he knew then what he knows now, he would have behaved differently so that uh, it was some expression of sympathy for the point of view expressed by Seal Guts and the other prosecutors who worked so hard to uh, establish the fact that industrialists had a responsibility to their slave laborers and it was a minimum human responsibility which some of these defendants never lived up to. And on that happy note, the time having run out and I'm promising Mr. Berker that I will keep it to schedule, I thank you all and we'll see you this afternoon. We'll vote on those resolutions at that time and do the other thing. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
this um, young woman is 11 years old, and unfortunately, apparently, her mother has not brought her in. Um, but I was in thought she'd be interesting to know that um, she is studying about the Nuremberg trials at the age of 11. So I'll just mention that in passing. Uh, I think it would be interesting to have Ray Dario come up here a minute. Where are you, Ray? Come here. Come on up. Is that independent study she's studying, or is that being presented in the classroom? We don't know. That 11-year-old. I, I don't know uh, the details of it. That's Ray, uh, you s stood in the courtroom for many, many hours taking pictures. And um, uh, many of us here have seen your pic some of your photographs down in the bar room. We thought that, wow. you know, that <laughs> <laughs> they, what's wrong with that? We, uh, did we have our drinks down there? <laughs> at, at all events, as you were taking these pictures, what would you say was one of the more uh, uh, astounding events that happened that uh, you'd like to tell us about? I have to... Oh. You got me on the spot here. I, I didn't... It's called Nuremberg's on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> Nuremberg's on the spot. Uh, I arrived in Nuremberg about uh, one week before the trial, and we were at one end of the building, and the dark room was at the other end of the building, and we had to walk back and forth and back and forth. That was one of the good things about being uh, employed in Nuremberg. Uh, also, we had all kinds of assignments. Uh, we had to photograph uh, the, the defendants, and that, that's one thing I want to say. Uh, nobody mentioned not any person here has mentioned about the uh, commandant of the prison. The prosecution was one building, and the, the, uh, the defendants in the prison was another, another job. Uh, it was a job to get both of them together. You had to have a little slip of paper. Every time you wanted to see a defendant, uh, you just didn't call up. You had to get a piece of paper. It was okay, and then they... <coughs> Then they brought the defendant up to you. Uh, another thing that I want to speak about that I remember, and that was going down the uh, long, long uh, corridor one day. Uh, I was going to, I had my, uh, uh, had an assignment, and there was a colonel. So I, I was a, uh, I guess I was a sergeant by then, and I saluted which I had to do. But the colonel turned out to be a general, General Taylor. <laughs> I remember that all the time. I'll remember from colonel to general. But the other general, he was the only general we ever had anyway. Uh, we didn't pay attention to any other general. Uh, uh, another thing that happened was the, the, the uh, colonel in charge of all the prisoners, all the defendants. You know that he was a colonel, and he remained a colonel, he died a colonel. He never was promoted. <laughs> all right? All right, fine. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, Dick Dillman? Yes. Oh, you're right there. Yeah. <laughs> Dick Doman uh, was in Nuremberg uh, during the time when the interrogation division interrogated some of the leading defendants, both uh, mainly before they were indicted. And I thought it'd be interesting to have to have. Um, Thank you. Very briefly, my friend. Uh, I want to tell you about an interesting event. Justice Jackson called a staff conference of the prosecutors. Telford Taylor was present. You, Rex, were present. Whitney Harris and Dick Haller were present. There were other 
assistant prosecutors present, but they are not present here, unfortunately, tonight, today. Justice Jackson told us that Generals Rudenko and Nikichenko, uh, the Soviet prosecutor and the Soviet judge, have just arrived, and John Hazard, Professor Hazard, who was supposed to be their escort interpreter, was taken ill. Was there anybody present who spoke Russian? Nobody held up his hand. That gave me the courage to hold up my hand. And I told <coughs> Justice Jackson that I studied Russian in Washington with OSS, and I know a minimum <coughs> amount of Russian. And therefore, I was appointed to be the escort of Judges Nikichenko and Rudenko. This was a formidable assignment. When I met the two Russian officials, they expressed the wish to see Goering and Hess. So I arranged to have Hess and Goering brought to the interrogation room. And that was my first chance to interrogate leading Nazi defendants. And that was my first chance in my professional life to interrogate anybody. <laughs> uh, Hess came first. And uh, Hess came handcuffed to two GIs. And, uh, and I conducted the interrogation which was translated into Russian. I spoke in English. English was translated into German and then to Russian. And uh, I asked Hess, do you know why you are here? And he looked at his handcuffs and said, I suppose I'm a war criminal. Otherwise, I wouldn't have handcuffs. And that uh, then I asked him what role he played in the Nazi party. And his answer was, I had nothing to do with the Nazi party. <laughs> and uh, I continued insisting that he had a role. And he was negative. Finally, I asked him, did you have anything to do with the Gestapo? And he looked with his blank eyes, and he said, no. Do you know what the terms Gestapo mean? Geheime Staatspolizei. He said, no. Do you know the word Geheim, secret? Staat, state, Polizei. No. And uh, so it was a frustrating experience. The Soviet officials did not participate in the questioning and they did not suggest any questions, but they listened carefully and they took notes. Finally, I asked him about the Nuremberg days and the Nuremberg party days and the uh, persecution of the Jews. I asked him, why did the party prosecute, persecute the Jews? And he said, he did not know anything about it. And finally, I asked him, isn't it correct that the Jews were just as good people as the non-Jews in Germany? Well, that was too much. He got up and screamed, that's not true. The Jews are the enemy of the German people, and they are on, uh, on their person, under humans. That's why we have to take steps against her. He got under his skin and he couldn't resist. After that came Goering. In the, uh, because the Soviet officials wanted to meet Goering as well. Goering arrived uh, shortly thereafter and I told Goering that I just met an important former official of the National Socialist Party. Is my time up? 
Yes, it's Mark, right. keep going. Go. 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 And he told me that he has never heard your name before. And Goering said, Unmöglich, that's impossible. <laughs> well, he wanted to know who that person was. So I told him it was Rudolf Hess. <laughs> and, and Goering said, is Rudolf here? I did not know. Yes, he arrived a couple days before. Could I meet him? And I could refresh his memory if anybody could refresh his memory. <laughs> so I arranged a confrontation between Goering and Hess. And Goering was sitting with Nikichenko and Rudenko and myself uh, at the prosecution table and Hess was brought in again. And when Hess saw Goering with us, he was startled and taken back. And it took a few seconds until he recovered. And Goering rushed to him and tried to kiss him. And Hess, with disgust, turned his face and body away as much as he could, having had handcuffs. And then Goering took over the interrogation, and we let, gave, gave him full reign. And Goering asked Hess, do you remember me? I am Hermann, etc. Goering. And he gave all his titles, and he had many titles, as you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Hess was negative. And Goering said, but Rudolf, don't you rem remember that you went to Scotland? And he said, no, I don't. Don't you remember that we had a meeting with the Führer and you explained your purpose, uh, plan to go to Scotland to meet Duke Hamilton, whom you met at the Olympic Games in 36. No, he did not remember. And you violated the Führer's order not to go to Scotland. Nevertheless, you took a, an aircraft and you flew by yourself. No, I've never been in the air except when I was brought here from Scotland. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Goering insisted but don't you remember, we flew together in the First World War, and you were a hero. And uh, he insisted that he was not in the air before. The interrogation continued, but Goering has not been successful. And uh, Hesse's memory was not refreshed. Is uh, Professor Steer here? Professor, could you work your way on this? Uh, I'd like to talk to this gentleman because he was in charge of the language division uh, during the first part of the trial. And as you know, in the first trial, we had to have interpretation into three different languages in order, because it was a four-power, a four-language trial, a multilingual trial. At your disposal, sir. <laughs> uh, we were wondering uh, whether or not you could tell us uh, an experience or two in, uh, concerning the use of language and the problems of language when you were head of the language division during the first trial. Um, I have to use a name. Is Virginia Gray here? Well, okay. <laughs> I, uh, you may recall the, uh, during the uh, trial we had concentration camp guards testify. And uh, uh, some of those individuals were scarcely human. And I went, uh, on one occasion, I recall during this, um, segment, I walked into the, we had a little a back door for the interpreter, I walked into the court through the back door, and um, 
Peter Uberall, who was sitting at the end of the interpreter's table, uh, was shaking his head and pointing at one of the interpreters. And I tuned it in. Now, we had split headphones in those days. Uh, I would put the original language in my left ear and the translation in my right ear so that I could tell what was going on. Uh, Virginia was interpreting, and this um, individual was using the most filthy, profane, decent language I've ever heard uh, in any language. French, German, anything else. And, um, and um, what they were doing was this. Uh, he would say, now I'm going to have to clean this up. Uh, he would say, let's say in German, um, you just have to expletive, sacrilegious expletive, expletive on the Jews. On the right here from Virginia Gray would come through like this. You just have to scorn the Jews. Well, um, that was the, the gist of it, but it was by no means, you know, an, an interpretation. And so, uh, fortunately, the uh, court was about to adjourn for the mid-morning break. I grabbed Virginia and I dragged her into the hall. I said, listen, young lady, you cannot do this. I said, you must interpret precisely what you hear. And she says, well, Commander, I don't use those words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, well, I, that doesn't make any difference. I said, you are a servant of the court, and the court, everybody else, is relying on you to give an accurate understanding of what this individual is and what sort of the test, the, how, how they are to take his testimony. Well, she clouded up, and she wasn't about to say yes, sir. So I took the cowards, well, I just walked away. <laughs> uh, for some reason, uh, that does those um, recesses lasted for 10 minutes, if you recall. Um, I didn't get right back in, but when I did get in, it was a moment after the court had started uh, convening again, um, there was a gust of laughter swept through the court. Well, now, laugh, anything is absolutely impossible. Uh, with, from that individual without the last laughter. It just, it, um, and I noticed as I sat down that the people laughing were people I knew would be listening to me. So I put in my two headphones again, and here's what had happened. I'll, I'll use the same thing. Uh, the, 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 the witness would say, you just have to expedite, expedite the profanity, profanity trap on the Jews. Um, Virginia would say everything up to the beginning of the filthy language. Then she would take her handheld microphone, reach it across to her seatmate, who was a colonel in the British Army, <laughs> whose name was uh, McPherson, I think, and with a very thick Scottish accent. And he would supply all the... <laughs> <laughs> then she would bring the, color, uh, the microphone back and give the rest, you see. Well, uh, Virginia had solved her problem. She didn't use those words, you see. It was accurate, but um, it was a sideshow. And we couldn't let this uh, uh, continue, so I had to replace her. And, uh, 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 by the way, she's now a, uh, a librarian at the uh, Stony Book uh, on Long Island. Thank you very much, Commander. There's a break period now, but would you try to be back, uh, Virginia, how long? We need them to move out very quickly because the hotel has to set these tables up for lunch. Then you return at 12.30, hopefully we will be able to open the door. The quicker you go out, the better everything will be. All right, we'll see you about 12.30 then. Hello. Our uh, last panel is made up of some distinguished uh, persons who've been very much interested in justice and world order and humanitarian uh, matters. Um, naturally, they face, they know the world faces many problems in this area. And what we entitle this program, this part of the program, is various tasks and problems in the national and international policy concerning the world order. Now that gives them quite a bit of leeway with respect to how they approach it. I'm very glad to present to you the chairman of the uh, of this particular program, Father Drynan, Professor Robert Drynan of Georgetown University. He is a widely known humanitarian. He's written a half a dozen books that, over the years, 
which deal with important subjects uh, concerning justice. He's a professor at the Georgetown uh, University Law Center. I give you, uh, once again, another speaker who I think you will find very interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Sprecher, and uh, my greetings and my congratulations to all of you. Some time ago, I was talking with Judge Goldstone, and I had my vision and my hope of a permanent Nuremberg renewed by what Judge Goldstone said. And last summer, I spent six weeks lecturing in South Africa, and they too are looking for their own version, if you will, of uh, the Nuremberg. And that every country that has thrown off the shackles of a dictator, such as Chile and Argentina, has this basic question of accountability. And you people now for 50 years have been involved in that great human principle that those who offend human rights should be denied the right and should be penalized. And there should be restitution or indemnification. And consequently, I commend you for what you are doing here. I find the whole question of the new Nuremberg uh, endlessly exciting. I was on the task force of the American Bar Association on the new Nuremberg, chaired by Monroe Lee, a former uh, legal advisor of the State Department. And I commend to you a document that just came out, the Fletcher Forum of World Affairs, in which I and several others have uh, articles. There's a wonderful interview here with our great hero, Telford Taylor, who is here, and that who, uh, if you will, started all of this. I recall very vividly, especially today, when I was first introduced to Nuremberg through conversations with Father Edmund Walsh, a Jesuit uh, who was there as a special advisor. I was a young man at that time going to law school, and Father Walsh and I would talk uh, many, many times about what he did and about the urgent necessity of having a permanent Nuremberg. And ever since that time, I have been, if you will, uh, addicted to this idea. And that's why I am so happy that you people are keeping it uh, moving. And Mr. Ferenz and Henry King and so many here have kept this flame alive. And that I was reminded, thinking of this lovely ceremony this afternoon, of those lovely words that President uh, Kennedy used to use that the vision will never fade and the dream will never die. I think that the United States is to be commended for all it has done for the new Nuremberg. And I talk on a regular basis with John Shattuck, the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. And I would think that he, possibly more than anybody in the administration, has committed the Clinton uh, White House to forwarding this and funding it and keeping it going. As you know, there were new charges made this morning, and the front page story of the New York Times suggests that this may be a new development. When three Bosnians were charged, now there are 53 charged, 46 of them are Serbs, and seven are Croats. And all of us are watching this unfolding with hoping against hope that it's not going to collapse. All of the cemeteries of Sarajevo and all of those who mourn the people there are waiting for humanity to make some judgment on what happened there as well as in Rwanda. Well, my task here today is very simple. I am the moderator of a very exciting panel. And at lunch, we uh, had the, the very complicated problem of who goes first. And it was decided very arbitrarily that we'll go alphabetically. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and that each of the speakers will come here. Uh, uh, we didn't want to put the lady first or last. Uh, so it turns out she's in the middle. Uh, some of you will say, well, as usual. But uh, uh, we have three uh, exciting speakers, and then obviously we want uh, your response. And that uh, I have suggested that they come here so all of you will see the speakers, and that 10 or 12 minutes uh, they will give their version. The first speaker will be Mr. Bill Duna. He is a member of the U.S. Holocaust Council. He is a professor at the University of St. Thomas. He is an American-born gypsy who represents the gypsies on the U.S. Holocaust Council, and he was appointed to that council by President Reagan in 1987. I know how important that council is because I was one of the first members appointed in 1980 by President Carter, and that he is the only gypsy on the Holocaust Council. His position uh, gives him a good deal of information about gypsies, and that he hopes that all this information will be included in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial in Washington. 
and he also monitors the human rights of gypsies in Europe and around the world, and we're very happy to have him. The second speaker will be Dr. Mary Johnson. She has her PhD in history, and she is the senior program associate of that wonderful organization based in my old congressional district in Brookline, Mass., Facing History and Ourselves. And Dr. Johnson has insights about how we are teaching or not teaching the Holocaust in Nuremberg to the entire world. The third, by no means the least speaker, is a very distinguished lawyer, Ellie Rosenbaum, graduated from Harvard Law School in 1980. He now serves as the director of the U.S. Justice Department Nazi Hunting Office of Special Investigations, the OSR, and that I helped to get the legislation through the Congress that established that office, and I have followed it with the greatest admiration since that time. Mr. Rosenbaum has been working on the Nazi cases in this country since 1979, and in 1986 he directed the investigation that resulted in the worldwide exposure of the Nazi past of former UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. And under his leadership, this new unit in the uh, Justice Department, the OSI, was recently described, uh, described on ABC television as, quote, the most successful government Nazi hunting unit on earth. So please welcome Mr. Bill Dooner, the first of our three speakers. Now to live up to everything he said. <laughs> but uh, I perhaps should tell you how I got involved with the United States Holocaust Council and then some of the things I've been doing on the council and what we're doing currently today. Some years ago, uh, teaching at the University of St. Thomas, I happened to pick up a book by uh, Ann Sutherland titled The Hidden Americans. And it was a book about gypsies on the West Coast and it was very stereotypical. And I was just outraged. I said, wait a minute. This isn't who we really are. This is one family. And it's, it's made to sound like all gypsies are like this. So I found out that Anne lived in the Twin City area and taught at McAllister College, which was not too far from my college. And one afternoon I called her and, and invited her to lunch and we sat down and we talked. And she was considered an expert, apparently, because she had written this book. After we got through talking, she realized that she was no expert and she really had dealt me and other gypsies an injustice by writing about this one family, which again is very stereotypical. People who wander around, travel around. Uh, gypsies as a rule today don't do that. Uh, it's, it's not our lifestyle. And um, I realize that something has to be done to change attitudes about who we are and the problems that we are facing in Europe. And she put me in touch with a very interesting fellow by the name of Dr. Ian Hancock, who was part of an organization called the International Federation of Roma, which was looking at human rights violations and particularly wanting to uh, be included in the United States Holocaust. I'm going to this off because I have a hard time bending down. And uh, they, at that time, the United States Holocaust Council was formed, and uh, they were looking at uh, building a museum here in Washington, which we have done. I was never aware at that time or or inquired into being a part of the United States Holocaust Council. I was concerned about human rights violations. And through my concern, the finger kept being pointed at me to be a member of this council. And eventually, I became a member. I was appointed by President Reagan. One of the things I found out since I came on the council that not too much information was there about what happened to gypsies, and it wasn't really accurate. There was a lot of sorting out. There were people who were trying to desperately get the information straight. And uh, in so doing, I was finding out a lot about myself I didn't even know. I didn't know about the first concentration camps being built in 1927, 1929. I didn't know the, the numbers of our people who suffered. I didn't know the experiments that were done on children and then women and children. And uh, I'm realizing this, it, it was a force to make me want to do more than I was really capable of doing at that time. And I got involved with human rights violations that were occurring, currently going on in Europe. My first trip to Europe was in Romania at a conference concerning human rights violations of gypsies. And at that time, uh, this is after the Ceausescu government had fallen, um, there were the citizens of that country felt that, hey, they can do anything now. There was no government to control them. And what they were doing was terrible. They were going after gypsies. They were burning their homes, murdering and raping them. And the government was just standing by, not knowing what to do, because they were in chaos. 
And uh, as a consequence of that, um, some human rights organizations got involved, and I got involved in it. And we went to Romania because at this time now, Romania is trying to get favorite trade status. And um, so we start talking with them and dealing with them and trying to resolve some of these problems. And in that time, I also found out that 80% of the orphans in Romania were gypsy children, 80% of them. And many of those children are treated just terrible because they're gypsies. They're, if you go to an orphanage and there are non-gypsy children, they get better attention than the gypsy children. It's a fact. And I'll tell you, if you doubt my word, there's an organization here uh, called Parents of Adopted Romanian Children. It's based here in Washington. The woman who heads that is Mary Thomas, who adopted uh, a couple, uh, adopted a, a gypsy orphan child. And she has documented the fact that gypsy children were treated terrible there. And uh, the conditions are just unbelievable. As an example, uh, there's 250 orphanages in Romania. There's over 100,000 orphans. Where do you put 100,000 orphans into 250 orphanages? I mean, it's impossible. I see kids. 10, 12, 15 to a crib, crying with no attention. Uh, it, it's, it just tears your heart out to see this. And you can't believe what you're seeing. And they don't have the staff, the money to take care of these kids. And many of those children could have been adopted and brought to the United States, but there were laws that said that a child is not adoptable if it has any contact with a, per of a parent uh, for five years. And what would happen is, in Romania, a lot of these parents couldn't feed their children. They would take them to a hospital thinking they're going to be taken care of. And then from the hospital, they would wind up in an orphanage. And the orphanage, they, they would go visit these kids periodically. In Romania, it's so poor. I mean, you talk about poor. There's the poorest of the poor. I've seen kids eating grass. Grass, just taking grass and boiling grass to eat it. it it's just unbelievable. Well, these children would be visited by their parents and then it would be another five years before they would be adoptable. So they were going to be institutionalized forever. The outcome of that, of our meeting, uh, and when I say our meeting, that was the State Department sent over uh, Kay King from Congressman Lampus' office, myself and some other people to this conference. We were able to reduce that to six months and then they added another three months after that. So now if a parent has contact with a child in nine months after that, they can be adopted. Also, at that time, you could only adopt handicapped children. But you wanted a healthy child, you went over there, uh -uh. you had to be handicapped. So they had ways of getting around that. They could say his ears were a little crooked or something, and he's handicapped, therefore you can adopt him. But it was costing a lot of money. And now all that has changed. So you can go over there through certain organizations, and uh, you can adopt a child perhaps for around $5,000. Whereas before it was costing maybe fifteen, twenty, maybe $25,000 and all these middlemen were making a lot of money on it. So we have these children that desperately need to be adopted, and they are being adopted. And last year at Disney World, they had a reunion. Of, uh, the parents brought these children, and there was something like 200 children that came that were adopted. And they made a big thing about it on the 4th of July. Here they are, and now American citizens, of course they were American citizens by the fact, virtue of the fact that they were adopted by Americans, but it was kind of nice, it was a big event. And I got to see these kids. These kids were running around and playing. They had so much life and energy, and they brought such a sparkle to every one of those parents. I looked at them and I said, you know, this is great. This is America. If it wasn't for these people, those children would be dead today. They would have no life, or they would be retarded, because without any attention, just laying there in the crib, no stimulus, they certainly wouldn't be retarded, and a lot of them so that was a good feeling that we had, that we could change that. And that's what I, one of the things I did. Okay. I also went to Drew University, uh, excuse me, I went to Germany for a conference, and I met a very interesting woman there who was at this conference uh, concerning the Holocaust of the future. Um, and we talked, and she happened to be a professor at Drew University. Her name is uh, Jackie Clay. And Jackie uh, wasn't aware of gypsy suffering in the Holocaust. And here she is teaching Holocaust studies at the university. You didn't know, know a little about it. And we talked on our trip on this bus going to Sachsenhausen, which is a former concentration camp in Germany, outside of Berlin. And she, she was just amazed at what she was learning at the back of the bus. So we come back to the United States. 
few months later, she gives me a call, and she wants to put on a conference at Duke University concerning gypsies. It was the first conference that was ever held concerning gypsies anywhere in the world that I know of. The first conference in the United States, certainly. And so, we had this conference. It was a huge success. And out of that conference, there were many scholars that came, and for the first time, they heard our story. They documented our story. If you pick up books on the Holocaust, and you look at the back of the book, see how much information there is about Gypsy. You'll find maybe one page, maybe two pages. But that's about all. And do you know, we lost over a million people. And do you know that the, I said the first concentration camps were built for Gypsies? You'll never see that in any of those books. Do you know that many of the medical experiments were done on gypsy children and men and women? You don't seem to see that. And that kind of bothered you. Why? Why weren't we seeing this information? And today, these scholars recognize the fact that, yes, indeed, we have to make some changes. We have to look at what we've been reporting and talk about. What are the benefits for gypsies? When there's an acknowledgment of what happened in the past, it will possibly prevent what will happen in the future. And that's the premise of the museum, the United States Holocaust Museum. By telling the story of what happened in the Holocaust, another Holocaust will never happen again. So it's very important for us as gypsies. And we see those results. We see governments willing to cooperate and work with us in solving some of their human rights violations. When I was in Romania, I also went to a small village which was burnt out uh, when Ceausescu's government fell. So the, in the village, the, you have targers. There are Tatars in Romania, there's many different ethnic groups, Greeks, there are Germans, and all these groups, they just all of a sudden get the gypsies, let's get them out of this village. And they attack them and they burn them. I seen a little girl, she was about 12 years old. When we came into the village, the mother came up and kept arguing with the officials. And I, she was speaking in Romanian, and I pulled her on the side, and I could speak the gypsy language. I, there's several dialects, and I could get by with I, I pulled her by and I asked her the gypsy, what was the problem? And she was shocked. Here I am sit, standing in a suit and tie and coming, how do I can speak her language? And when I convinced her that I was a gypsy and I was willing to listen to what she had to say, she brought her little girl to me. She lifted her dress up and from her ankles all the way up to her waist were scars like I'd never seen in my life. They, she was burnt. They, they burned their home. This child was burnt from her ankles up. And with no medical attention, the government was not even bothering to do anything about this. And here's this little girl paying the price simply because she was a gypsy. Well, I'll tell you, my heart went down to my shoes. And uh, we took pictures of this little girl and tried to arrange some way to get her out, attempting plastic sur surgery or whatever was necessary for this little girl. But that's the kind of things that were happening all the time. And it, it, was, it was just an isolated case. And why? Because we're gypsies. This is okay to do. You're a gypsy. You can do it. Nobody's going to care. and Nobody's going to say anything about it. But by making you aware of what's going on, maybe you will care, and maybe the future will be better for those people. Last night I said, my biggest payoff is when a gypsy child can say, I'm a gypsy, and what are you? You know, what's your nationality? And feel really good about it. And I feel like they're going to, by saying that, they're leaving themselves open to being persecuted in some kind of way. That will be the big payoff for me. That's my pilot. Yes. All right, now, thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you a second time. <laughs> I hope I have been. I guess I'll give you some information on insight what it is to be a gypsy in today's world and the problems that we do face. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Um, for many reasons that we've heard over the last two days, um, I feel that it's absolutely essential that <coughs> Nuremberg and its meaning and the lessons from it somehow become an integral part of education in our middle schools, our high schools, and our colleges. Not only because we learn about the trial and what happened there, but also for the moral lessons that we get from it. And to hear some of the incredible stories that come out of that era, especially when prosecutors were dealing with the defendants and 
finding what have we done wrong? And, 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 and the kind of responses that went on there. Um, now, as important as it is that Nuremberg be part of people's education, incredibly enough, there is very little material that is put in a way that can go into the classrooms and teachers without a lot of background can take and feel comfortable with enough to bring it. So what happens? It sort of doesn't get dealt with, or there's a little bit done with it, despite the fact that we have so much information on it. So what I'm particularly interested in, and I'm finding a number of people right here at the, at the reunion, uh, Flora Singer, um, Linda um, Peroni, uh, and others, very interested in how do we get this material to the next generation in a way that it's not just we know the word or as Margo said yesterday they might not even know what that N word is and we want to make sure they know what that N word is but also I want them to understand something like what Professor King talked about this morning of some of the major issues that were brought up during these trials and that are still living with us today and their implications, and have some sensitivity to understanding what, what it is like um, to hear about a time when human rights were so violated, and what that meant, and what the implications were, and maybe get that, what William Dunner was just talking about, maybe get enough sensitivity that maybe people will even think about it so it doesn't happen again. Now the question is, how are we going to do this? Um, we have a mass of material, some of it quite technical, uh, that needs to be presented in a way that, that can be dealt with. First off, what we need is just basic materials that I can take to Blackfoot, Idaho, and other wonderful places that I go to, and say, here is a narrative of what happened. In a form where the students can deal with it, and where the teachers feel comfortable, yes, at least I know this is what happened, these are the players, these were the issues presented there. Right now, as far as I know of, except there are some curriculum that have been developed, there is nothing that just goes out and is dist distributed widely that provides just the basic information. Now, just recently, Court TV, and many of you probably watched the 15 hours uh, of uh, Nuremberg on Court TV. Um, they put the 15 hours out. It's a wonderful, wonderful 15 hours, but 15 hours in our schools today, they can't, they don't have 15 minutes to do this. So uh, there is now an effort to get a one hour composite of what was in the 15 hours which will provide the basic narrative of what happened and maybe a, a, a starting point for getting into school and some basic curricular materials there. Also, Whitney Harris has, has been working, I believe, with a program that would be able to go into schools. Just say, this is what happened, all right? We need that first. Then we need everything that's been going on here the last two days. I wish we had hundreds of students here. I know we couldn't fit them in this room. One, for them just to know, here were people that were part of an era that believed the world could be changed by setting the rule of law, getting the record straight, and having people think about it. And utterly believed, because so many times you go in schools today, and students don't believe you can make a difference. They, they, they feel, you know, there's just too many things involved in the world. They're sort of jaded about things. And they don't have that fundamental optimism. For them to rub shoulders with people that, that worked at a time when they believed something could be done would be an incredible, incredible opportunity. And I've had a chance to witness how this happens with a group. Uh, about two weeks ago, Whitney Harris was with a group of teachers, all of whom are now going to go back and deal with hundreds of students. And he told about his time at Nuremberg. And then he said, and when I prosecuted the Calvin Brunner case, and all the teachers, 
like this. And just talking about his experiences there, that's so important. We've had Ben Ferenz who's gone into many classrooms. Uh, Walter Rockler, several years ago, came with me to a school outside Boston, and students still haven't forgotten him. They're still talking about that experience. So to take from the basic narrative and embellish it with the stories and with the people that were actually there. So this is a very important part of, of bringing this story. Then, I think we need to embellish also with the wonderful visual materials. And we saw some great Dadarios materials that are out there. Um, I still was so amazed yesterday when Dr. Latimer had that wonderful presentation with the artifacts and the stories. And if we could carry those stories and the artifacts into our classrooms, I mean, students would be riveted by it, I think. And it would, it would bring to life what happened there. And the more visual material, today in the classrooms you need visual materials. It can't just all be documents. It needs some visual materials. The more we have of that. Finally, in terms of embellishing, um, I would like to get some just fundamental documents in the schools that they could see. This came, this is the opening speech by Justice Jackson. And have students work with the material itself. Not everybody else's commentary, but see the words themselves. And then have the teachers feel comfortable enough that they can help the students try to interpret this material. Have the teachers feel comfortable enough with legal terminology and so forth. Now, that gets to the next point. Once we get materials, both of the fundamental narrative and the embellishing, we need to work with teachers so that they feel, wow, I can bring this into the classroom and I can talk about it and I'm not going to feel that it's something too, you know, too difficult to present to the students. And what's happening in the last couple of years is very exciting to me is increasingly seminars, workshops for teachers, where they can begin to explore some of these issues. Uh, and just this year, uh, in Virginia Beach, we're going to have a three-day seminar for teachers, and already over 100 teachers have signed up for this. Um, just so they can learn, here's the material, here's how to talk about it, and here are some of the implications of it that I can bring into my classroom. The more we can make teachers feel that they understand it, the more they'll bring it up. I think right now one of the problems that intimidates them is that oh, uh, the student might ask me a question which I just don't know the answer. So we want to make them feel comfortable that way. And finally, we need to work increasingly on having materials that are ready for taking into the schools to say, here are where you can go with what you know about Nuremberg. And how does this apply to our lives today? So the connections with what's going on in Bosnia and Rwanda are absolutely essential. Because otherwise, if teachers and students um, aren't helped with that, they're going to make rather strange connections. So we need to work with them and give them the materials for doing that. It's all available, and much of it's been mentioned already here. Um, and right now there is work going on to try to get the curricular materials into every, I hope, middle school, high school, and college so they can be able to deal with this incredible material. Thank you. begin my remarks, I, I hope that I can be permitted to make a brief uh, personal statement. Uh, for those of us at the United States Department of Justice who've been taking part in the final effort to secure some uh, measure of justice on behalf of Hitler's victims, the men and women, you people, responsible for that landmark in world jurisprudential history, in, in world history, uh, known as, as Nuremberg, uh, are giant figures legendary figures for us. Uh, with uh, uh, considerable frequency, uh, our briefs in court cite both the Nuremberg Charter under which you labored 
and key passages from the momentous uh, decisions that you won. It is an enormous privilege uh, for me simply to be in the same room with you. Uh, some of you have already been uh, pestered by me for autographs. I feel rather like a young man of my generation would tend to feel uh, going to one of those fantasy baseball camps with the uh, 1961 New York Yankees. You're the 61 Yankees for me. Uh, I actually had the privilege, the honor of, of working under one of your number, uh, Walter Rockler, who's in the back there, who was the first director of the Office of Special Investigations. And I'm pleased to see that two of the uh, finest attorney alumni of my office, Judge Bruce, Bruce Einhorn and Professor Jonathan Bush, are, are here as well. Uh, for the privilege of uh, being permitted to participate uh, here today, uh, I, I must especially thank Drexel Strecker and, and his wife, Virginia, and uh, also one of my, my real heroes, and that's not a word I, I use lightly, Father Drynan, uh, one of the fathers also of OSI. Uh, you know all of these people. I also want to thank someone whom many of you may not know, and that's Flora Singer, who is a uh, child survivor from Belgium, uh, someone whose passionate dedication to remembering the victims and more importantly to fusing action to that memory is an inspiration to so many people all over the country and especially here in, in the nation's capital. Uh, for the past 16 years, the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations, OSI, has been the U.S. government's sole authority for the investigation and prosecution of persons implicated in the perpetration of Nazi uh, uh, crimes of persecution, a subset of crimes against humanity uh, in the Nuremberg Charter's framework. During this period, OSI's comparatively small staff of attorneys, historians, and support personnel has been responsible for bringing and winning far more such prosecutions than any other law enforcement unit of its kind in the world. The hundreds of substantive and procedural decisions we have obtained have made major contributions to the development of human rights law, for example, via the continuing development uh, of the, by the courts of the concept of persecution. I'm especially gratified that uh, as we meet here today, there are people in The Hague poring over and using not only the precedents that you helped establish, but also those uh, in OSI's cases. Our work at OSI has been difficult and often very frustrating. Many of those problems and frustrations are directly traceable to the Cold War. Thus, our access to evidence behind the former Iron Curtain was limited, just as it was for you at Nuremberg. Testimonial evidence obtained in the countries of the former Warsaw Pact were discounted or even disbelieved by some American courts. And some Nazi criminals were able to evade extradition or deportation because the only countries that would take them were communist ones, with which we either had no treaty of extradition or to which some of our courts declined to deport. In the absence of an international tribunal to which these people could be delivered, some were able to retain their safe havens in this country and elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. The central change in our world order since the time of Nuremberg has been, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of communist rule throughout Eastern and Central Europe, and the cessation at long last of the Cold War. For prosecutors in the countries in which Nazi crimes are still the subject of concerted law enforcement action, namely the United States, Germany, Canada, and England, this change has had dramatic consequences. For the first time, we can actually get our own personnel inside the key archives, including archives of the former communist intelligence services, including the KGB. And we have found in those archives a veritable treasure trove of evidenti evidentiary riches. Just yesterday I was working with a colleague uh, looking at a death warrant signed by one of our defendants for a six-year-old girl and her mother. The captured documents that OSI personnel have found in those archives have enabled us to institute and win cases in the past two years at what is very nearly the fastest pace in our history. So it's an irony and a surprise to all of us because this occurs at a time when we fully expected to be either winding down or actually to be bringing to an end this prosecutorial effort. No longer, moreover, 
can uh, the witnesses we find in places like Ukraine, Russia, Lithuania, Poland, Latvia, be accused by defense counsel of singing the KGB's tune? Also gone are most of the legal obstacles to extradition and deportation that I mentioned. On the international level, as has already been mentioned by uh, uh, several speakers uh, here in the past two days, the ending of the Cold War has at last made it possible to resume the noble work that you began at Nuremberg half a century ago. The East-West animosities that prevented any repetition of Nuremberg, even in the face of mass slaughter in places like Cambodia and elsewhere, have largely dissolved. Accordingly, in the new world in which we live, the establishment of international tribunals to deal with war crimes and crimes against humanity has, ac has again become reality, not just fantasy. Credible efforts to bring to justice those who perpetrated beastful crimes in Bosnia and Rwanda are already underway. And for the first time, the world's leaders are willing to act even in the absence, absence of a military conquest, such as the one over Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, to provide the victors with ready access to suspects and witnesses and, and other evidence. Thus, the ending of the Cold War has, in a very real sense, multiplied exponentially the value of Nuremberg's legacy, your legacy. Even in this new world uh, that we have suddenly entered, it is important to bear in mind the goals to be pursued in apprehending, trying, and punishing international criminals. The basic purposes are manifestly the same as those that underlie uh, domestic systems of criminal law, retributive justice, and deterrence. Many have questioned whether prosecuting these cases does in fact have a deterrent effect. The skeptics invariably cite the Nuremberg trials and point out that the lessons of Nuremberg notwithstanding, international tyrants of subsequent generations have not been dissuaded from perpetrating acts of mass cruelty, even genocide against minorities in, for example, Cambodia, Iraq, and most recently in Rwanda and Bosnia. Those of us who believe in the prophylactic effect of these prosecutions reply that the, the mere fact that, that these crimes uh, continue to occur hardly disproves the theory uh, that uh, others are, some others are being prevented. But we have to admit that we find ourselves armed with little hard evidence with which to respond. The principal reason uh, for this is that almost by definition we cannot cite the quote-unquote war crimes that never took place. After all, what uh, would be Hitler is going to admit that he was contemplating such a program of savagery, uh, but then changed his mind uh, either for fear of prosecution or for any other reason. We can posit that a man like uh, Ferdinand uh, Marcos, the former dictator of the Philippines, uh, chose to flee his country rather than order the tanks that surrounded the presidential palace to fire on the thousands of unarmed demonstrators assembled there because he feared that he might one day be brought to the bar of justice to answer for the atrocity. But in the end, such scenarios are mere speculation. In the absence of empirical data or, or even of reliable anecdotal evidence, we prosecutors and others who are committed to these prosecutions are left to rely on the standard criminological studies performed in this country and elsewhere that persuasively demonstrate that effective measures to bring to justice perpetrators of conventional domestic crimes do indeed serve to deter some crime. What all of these studies show, however, is that for apprehension and prosecution to serve as an effective deterrent, these actions must be taken consistently, successfully, and publicly. In other words, those who might contemplate committing these kinds of crimes must see that if they dare to act on those impulses, there is a high likelihood of apprehension, trial, conviction, and appropriate punishment. Tragically, it is by this standard that the world's endangered ethnic, racial, and religious minorities have been so grievously, and one might say lethally, deserved. The post-war world, that upon learning uh, the gruesome details of Treblinka, Oradour, Auschwitz, Babi Yar, etc., that world that swore never again has rarely acted on that vow. Instead, we have seen in the years since Nuremberg little more than empty threats hurled at the perpetrators of ethnic cleansing and similar atrocities. What the world has seen, moreover, is that even the perpetrators of Nazi crimes escape justice in most cases. The US, United Kingdom, and Soviet Union, the three great powers that publicly warned Hitler and his acolytes on November 1, 1943, 
that they would, quote, be pursued to the uttermost ends of the earth and be delivered to their accusers, close quote, largely gave up on efforts to prosecute Nazi war criminals just three years after the war's end. Fighting the Cold War, of course, was the new priority, and the enemies of the recently concluded hot war were courted as allies in this great East-West ideological struggle. Indeed, the intelligence and military services of the two nations most responsible for the defeat of Hitler's armies, the United States and the former Soviet Union, competed for the services of some of the men who had, competed, who had uh, uh, committed Nazi crimes, men like Klaus Barbie, the former Gestapo chief of Lyon, France, and Nazi slave master Arthur Rudolph, who went on to head NASA's Saturn V rocket program in this country. Before long, individuals who were implicated in Nazi crimes were seen to rise to prominence in the political, industrial, medical, and academic spheres uh, throughout Europe. Notorious Nazi criminals found sanctuary in South America, the Middle East, Africa, and North America. To be blunt, the reason that deterrence has been so little in evidence around the world is that the international community's failure of will since Nuremberg has taught the most horrible of lessons. You can sometimes get away with perpetrating war crimes and crimes against humanity. Without the credible threat of prosecution and punishment, tyrants will not be deterred. If such trials are held, of great importance in enhancing their protective effect is prominent and accurate media coverage of the proceedings, just as you had at Nuremberg. This is because justice, of course, must be not only done, it must be seen to be done, both by the victims of the past and the would-be perpetrators of the future. New technologies of mass communication, such as the internet and the CD-ROMs, compact discs, are already being harnessed for this purpose. I wonder how many of you know that you can now buy a single shiny computer disc. I've got a brochure for it here. I'm not involved in it. Uh, that disc contains all 68 Nuremberg volumes, the green series, the red series, and even the blue series, all 42 of the blue series volumes, on one disc, searchable by word. Publicity also serves uh, an additional uh, salutary informational purpose. For instance, one who is able to follow the Nazi uh, war crimes trials in the Federal Republic of Germany soon learns that there were SS men who refused orders to take part in atrocities, and yet they suffered no serious adverse consequences. The knowledge that one could indeed say no, even to the justly dreaded SS, might have profound implications for the predicament of decent soldiers and fighters elsewhere who receive similarly criminal orders in the future. In 1996, we are on the threshold of change. Perhaps we may even be permitted to hold out some modest hope that the end of the Cold War and the renewed commitment to the use of international criminal courts will presage the dawning of a new era, one in which fundamental notions of human dignity and decency embodied in the provisions of international law that are supposed to protect this world's racial, uh, ethnic, and religious minorities will at last be enforced vigorously, credibly, and most importantly, consistently. If that happens, it will be in no small measure due to the extraordinary pioneering efforts of the Norbergers. God bless you all. Well, I thought he was going to make a question. <laughs> Here's a question from the audience, uh, right here. I had a question for Eli and myself. In the mic. Okay, I'm going in the mic. If you want to record yourself for history, I think that might be helpful. Eric Epstein, Penn State uh, University. Eli, I had a question for you, probably the obvious, actually two questions. One, any idea of the status on Eloy's Bruner? whether he's alive or dead. Also, John Demunuk has seemed to have uh, faded from uh, the arena. Uh, I live in an area where there's a lot of Ukrainians and Croatians, and uh, when I wrote a letter to the editor, very interesting response. So I was wondering, could you update us on the status of either Demunuk or Alois Bruner? Uh, real, real briefly. Should I do it from here? I think so. Yeah. Is that right? uh, there are reports that Bruner is dead. There are suspicions that he died a long, long time ago and that the sightings of recent decades have been false ones. 
I think anyone who says that they know where Bruner is or was doesn't know. No one knows. Uh, the one thing that we can be sure of is that the Syrian government, which was, has been uh, uh, widely suspected of, of harboring Bruner, has not done all that it could do to uh, establish that uh, Brunner has not been there. As to Demyanyuk, that's a very long story, and the case is in litigation again, so there isn't much that I can say. But in summary, uh, as most of you know, uh, Demyanyuk was released uh, by the Israeli Supreme Court when evidence that had been withheld by the former Soviet Union trickled out that cast some doubt on the accusation that he was the infamous Ivan the Terrible of the uh, Treblinka gas chambers. But the same Israeli court decision that let him go, Supreme Court decision, which I hope will soon be available in English, uh, shows that the Supreme Court had no doubt that he was involved in the mass murder of Jews at Sobibor, for instance, which was the mirror image of Treblinka, as you all know, albeit a bit smaller. Uh, he is back here now as a result of an order of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and Attorney General Janet Reno uh, has announced that we will uh, uh, spare no effort to, to attempt to enforce the order of deportation that my colleague now, Judge Einhorn, uh, won against Demyanyuk uh, some years ago, and uh, we hope to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have, a, have a question, and I'm certain that it haunts the people here. What can we do to keep better informed ourselves and inform other people about what is going on in the new Nuremberg? And I mentioned this morning that in the Times, now for the first time, the U.S. Nation, the United Nations Criminal Tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia today issues its first indictment for crimes against Serbs. I think that you and I and all of us follow this, but I am afraid, frankly, that we're going to get tired of it, just like the world got tired of Nuremberg and as you people know better than I, the second and the third tier people never really went to jail. Some didn't even go to trial. And then I'm afraid that uh, the Congress and the country is going to weary of all of this and that we won't be appropriating it and it won't get any visibility. I wonder if uh, members of the panel or other people here would want to make specific suggestions as to how we can keep informed and inform the public about this urgently important matter. Well, how can we keep it warm? Just from my own perspective, what I'm doing right now helps you to have information about what Jim has gone through. I mentioned last night uh, that in the Czech Republic, we just recently found out about concentration camps during the German, uh, during the uh, Second World War, that um, the Czechs ran for the Germans and never have they been brought to trial. Uh, these people are sort of laughing up their sleeves that they, they killed 600,000 gypsies and they buried them in this pot of land that now is a pig farm and they, they, there's nothing that we can do about it. Um, by making you aware of that and building uh, an opinion, public opinion, that something should be taken place. Perhaps Eli will investigate that. There you go. As, as far as keeping keeping informed, I guess it's it's the old story. Uh, the media has to hear from from uh, TV viewers and newspaper readers that they want information about this. Uh, one thing that's changed since Nuremberg is we have television, and Core TV is promising to bring us live coverage of, of the proceedings, uh, and maybe maybe that will uh, change things. Uh, from my own perspective, uh, I, I, I share uh, Father Drynan's fear because. Uh, we try our cases in a virtual media vacuum. Uh, we filed a very important case a few years ago against a man named Jonas Stelmokas, whom we proved with documentary evidence, took part in the largest single killing action in Lithuania during the Second World War. The shooting to death of 15,000 people in little more than 24 hours, men, women, and children. When we filed the case, the Justice Department issued a standard press release no major newspaper outside of the city in which this man was living, Philadelphia, bothered to pick it up. Uh, when we tried the case, a full trial in federal district court in Philadelphia, no newspaper outside of Philadelphia covered it. They were too busy covering you-know-whose trial in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, when we won the case, neither the New York Times, nor the Washington Post, nor the Los Angeles Times bothered to mention it. So I guess as far as the world is concerned, it never happened. Uh, and the, the fear that, that you express is, is a very real one. It can happen again. 
I think this is a perfect instance of where the more materials accessible for our schools on this and really helping to make those connections, uh, the more at least we can try to get um, people thinking about it. And it's in the schools where we're going to reach young people with questions. Uh, and maybe that will, will help to keep, because even with the old Nuremberg, I guess we have old and new Nuremberg, I guess after the first year, the media kind of got tired of that too. Is that, is that correct? I guess most of you could answer that for me better than I can on that. Um, I think we need, education needs to be one way to work on that. Uh, let me add one thing that you people may know about this, but there is a symposium on the criminal tribunals in the wake of the mass violence conducted by Duke University in Europe uh, on Saturday, J July 20, and Sunday, July 21. And Judge Goldstone will be the dinner speaker. And uh, this is a brochure put up by Duke. I have some hope that I might be able to participate in this. It has the usual suspect speaking and all, but that uh, even I and some of you may be a little taken aback as to the bulk of the work that lies ahead enormous amount of documentation. For example, on this brochure it says that by July 1996, prosecutions by these new national and international criminal tribunals will have been underway for several months, while the bulk of their work will still lie ahead. The summer of 1996, therefore, it says, is an optimal time to convene, and I hope that you people can get to this or follow this up, because to repeat the more constant flow of information about this, the better for all of us. I think there was a person here, yes. Oh, I just wanted to, you know, I had some anecdotal evidence of maybe two or three cases of who are these people who have subsequently been arrested? Where all right, the question they, is this, what does, are they doing? What jobs all right, does Eli have some anecdotal evidence of the material he was speaking about? The, the, the U.S. Uh, cases? Yeah, I'm curious what reaction they have when they're suddenly arrested and they, they express remorse this many years later and who are these? The, the people that have been prosecuted by our office have, in general, with some exceptions, been the lower level perpetrators, uh, not the people, uh, uh, not people at the level that, that you all were prosecuting at Nuremberg. Uh, and they've had generally relatively mundane uh, existences in this country. Their goal was to disappear into the woodworks. So they had factory jobs uh, and similar kinds of, uh, of work. Uh, I remember the I think it was the very first Nazi that I ever interrogated who was a, uh, a mass killer from Ukraine. We found him in Troy, New York, working in a local meatpacking house in the cut and kill department. Uh, I always mention that one because that at least shows some consistency. Uh, but uh, there is, of course, Arthur Rudolph, who became a, a major figure in the U.S. missile program and then in the space program. Uh, so they're, they're they had different kinds of jobs. I've never seen one express true remorse, even when they confess to killing, which they do infrequently, but sometimes. Uh, just doesn't happen. Uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is for Eli. You quickly passed through that, that feeding gram, feeding you were mentioning. Some of us would like some more information as to where to get it and so forth to spread the about Nuremberg a little easier. Uh, I would I, like to have it if you... Sure. I, I actually, I have the brochure. I'm going to just say to anyone who wants to write it down. Uh, it's, uh, the outfit is called Aristarchus Knowledge Industries. A-R-I-S-T-A-R-C-H-U-S. <laughs> Aristarchus. And it's, uh, I can show this to anyone who wants to see it. P.O. Box 1020, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. Uh, we actually have this at OSI, and I'm embarrassed to say I haven't had a chance to go and watch it in action. But uh, if you folks are in town for a while, you're welcome to come and visit us, and we'll see it together. It is expensive. Uh, the lowest price I've seen is, is $395, but that's still a lot cheaper than buying all the volumes. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, Aristarchus Knowledge Industries. A R I S T A R C H U S. Knowledge Industries, uh, P.O. Box 1020, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. I don't get any commission. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Mrs. Brecken? You have it 30 minutes, I just want to Oh, all right, good. Now, no, you, did you have a question? No. A comment? There's a very thoughtful article in the Christian Science Monitor this week, March uh, 13th, about the war crimes trials, the first test. And that uh, here puts it in focus. In May, the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia tries its first president, peace in Bosnia hangs in the balance. And with the Dayton Accords, the people want to get out of Bosnia as soon as feasible. And it seems that Britain has been somewhat indifferent uh, to the commitments that it made. And that I think that this is another reason why all of us should be very well informed and should insist that the governments go forward with the prosecutions, even though we make uh, some type of an exit from Bosnia. Yes. Judith Leighton from Voice of America. With your indulgence, I'd like to ask two unrelated questions. The first I address to Dr. Johnson. Some time back, I had the pleasure, joy, of going to a history classroom where faith and history in ourselves is taught as a regular part of the curriculum, a full semester's course. And the students were really electrified by it. And they had the, because it was in this area, they had the opportunity to visit the museum. And I thought it was extraordinarily well taught. I reviewed the textbook or workbook at the time, and the most glaring omission was that concerning the Roma and Sinti. And my question to you is that being the case and so much now, so much more now becoming available about the fate of the gypsies, do you have <coughs> plans to issue a supplement and send it to the same schools that are using the facing history in ourselves curriculum? Uh, increasingly, as new material is coming out more and more available, we are doing a lot of supplementary guides, and that's certainly one that, that should be done. Um, the, the, the nature of the material and what makes it so exciting in the classrooms is that it constantly, there's new material coming in. Um, and we need to keep doing either revising books or getting new guides out. And so yes, it, you know, material can be done on that and should be done. Ian Hancock regularly takes part in our summer institutes in Switzerland and uh, in this country as well. And he, um, so he has also been making sure that we, we get the information for that. Thank you. And a second question, which has to do with Bosnia and the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. In the nature of my work, I hear two sides to that. I just, within the last week, I talked with Dr. Arya Nair at the Soros Foundation in New York. And as perhaps you know, and I'm directing this question, I think, mostly to Mr. Rosenblum, that there are good reasons for prosecuting war criminals in terms of peace in the future that where there is no justice, there will be no peace. At the same time, I've talked with people who say, if these war crimes are prosecuted, there will be no peace because the Serbs will become even less cooperative than they are now. What is your, what are your thoughts on this? And has the U.S. government or the U.S. Department of Justice taken any position and where does one go from now? 